Hello everybody, welcome to this presentation about extending system security features with eBPF. I'm Mauricio Vasquez and I work for Microsoft. Before I start talking about the work that we did to introduce some new security features based on eBPF for systemd, I want to talk about the security features that were already existing there before we did some of our work. So yeah, before we implemented these security features, systemd already supported some features based on eBPF. Uh, the first feature supported was the IP firewall. In this case, this feature allows us to count the IP packets based on the IP and also to deny or to allow those packets based on the IP address of, of, of those packets. Uh, in this case, those programs were implemented by writing the eBPF code directly in assembly. There was some kind of custom compiler that translated the configuration provided by the user to the eBPF assembly code. Another feature related to eBPF in systemd was the custom, the support for custom programs also for the IP firewall. In this case, the, the user can implement its own uh, eBPF program, so the user can compile the program and the user also is in charge of loading and pinning the programs and then uh, the only thing that is passed to systemd in this case is the path of those pin programs in the BPF file system. So months ago, uh, systemd got support for libpf. So there was a new property implemented there that is called allow bind port. And this is the first property that was uh, implemented by using the libpf support in systemd. Uh, by using this property, the users are able to restrict the set of ports that an application can bind to. Uh, this was done by Julia from Facebook and this is already released. This is available on the latest systemd release that is uh, version 249. Mm, the nice thing about the work that Julia did is that this work also introduced support for libpf in systemd. So it was not only about implementing these allowed by imports, but a whole framework for implementing new functionalities based on eBPF that use libpf were merged on systemd. So why is this support relevant? Okay, the, the first thing important for us is that by having the support, this is much easier to develop, to implement new eBPF based features. This is mainly because uh, by using libpf, we don't have to worry about writing the code in assembly. So we can write the code in C2C, we can use clan to compile to eBPF assembly code. So yeah, this is much easier. This is just the same as in other programming languages that we are usually writing the code in in high level languages and using a compiler to generate the assembly code. This is in the specific case of eBPF, there is not that many people that is able to write eBPF assembly code. And yeah, this is slower to, to develop a functionality using assembly. And this is also very difficult to maintain though. So yeah, in summary, uh, developing the programs using uh, C is much easier and faster for, for us. The other important factor about libpf is that we have the full libpf API available. So by using this library, we're, we're, we are able to handle the different BPF objects in the kernel. So for instance, we are able to create the maps. We are able to update, delete, get the elements in a map. We are able to load the programs in the kernel to attach those programs to the different hook points and so on. So there are so many functions in the libpf API that we, that we uh, have now available on systemd. The, the next part can be a, a little bit obvious, but I want to make it clear why we choose to use libpf. So uh, libpf is the official kernel library for eBPF. Actually, this, is, this library is directly developed in the kernel source tree. So this is, this is important for us because each time there is a new 
kernel feature related to eBPF, the support is implemented in, in libpf. So we can say that libpf is always updated to support the latest kernel, the latest eBPF uh, features in the Linux kernel. Some of those features that are interesting for us regarding the implementation that we did for SysMD are compiled once, run everywhere. So this is a technology that allows us to compile the eBPF program while we compile the whole SysMD binary. And then we just deploy that program in the different target machines without having to, to recompile that. I will explain a little bit more about that in a second. The second feature that was interesting for us is BPF Skeleton. So um, the BPF, BPF Skeleton is a mechanism that is implemented in BPF tool. Uh, by using it, we are able to get a C representation. We are able to generate a skeleton from an BPF object file that represents all the elements that are inside that file. So for instance, when we wrote the BPF program, we define some maps, we define some programs and so on, and we can handle all of those by using this, this skeleton. So this is a simplification that makes it easier again to implement and to handle the eBPF programs, maps and so on. Okay, so let's go into the details of the different properties that we implemented. Actually, we, we did two of them. The first one is restricted network interfaces. As it is implicit in the name, this is for restricting the, the network interfaces that processes can access. We support both an allow or an deny list. Mm, and yeah, for instance, this could, this could be used when we know that there is a service that shouldn't be accessing the, the internet. So in that case, we call whether we call deny the traffic on the internet facing network interface or we could lock that interface to the loopback. Uh, sorry, lo lock that service to the loopback interface. So we have different options. So the idea is if we know the interfaces that assist assistant uh, service should be using, then we can limit those interfaces to be sure that this service is not able to use any other uh, network interface on the system. Regarding the implementation of this uh, feature, uh, we did that by attaching two eBPF programs to the C group ingress and egress hooks of the systemd service. Uh, what is nice about this per se group uh, eBPF program is that we can keep separated eBPF programs for each SysMD service. So in this case, we have two different uh, eBPF programs for each SysMD service that is using this feature. And uh, from the implementation point of view, we don't have to worry about handling the logic of where is this application running? I mean, what is the C group where this application is running because each time the programs are executed, this is implicit, the C group where the application is running is already implicit on, on the program. Mm, in order to determine if a network interface is allowed or not, we have a hash map where we say the different network interface indexes. If the interface is not allowed, allow, we just drop the packet. Mm, yeah, uh, the size of this program is rather small. We have something like 50 lines of code. This is in C code. And yeah, I want to mention here that the, the PR that is implemented, this is a little bit big, but actually the piece that is doing the real work on eBPF is, is very small. So all the logic that we have around is to load the programs, to populate the maps and so on. Actually, the, the logic that is inside the eBPF program is very, very small. For this feature, we require the kernel version 5.7. This is because we decided to use eBPF links for handling the uh, systemd daemon reload and, re and daemon reesec. So this is because if we got a file descriptor for the eBPF link, we don't have to worry about unloading the program, detaching the program and so on. We can just pass the file descriptor for, for the link from one systemd instance to the another one. 
the, the support is already merged. So it was merged uh, some months ago and this will be available in the next system D release. This is version 250. Okay, this is time to do a quick demonstration about how we can use that. In my system, I have two different network interfaces. I have the loopback one and I have another that I use to reach the internet. In order to create a temporary a CSND unit, I'm going to use CSND run and I'm going to pass the restricted network interfaces property to show you how it works. So let's start by creating a service that is only able to access the uh, inter the interface that is your storage the internet so in this case the ping is working this pin is going to the public internet and this is the interface that we use to reach the internet so yeah everything is working fine as it should be if I try to pin the local host with the same rule this is not gonna work because in this case the host packets are going to the loopback interface but the restoration allows only to use the MP0S3 interface. If I change this to the loopback interface, this will start working again. Another thing that I can do is to restrict to use a deny list. So by using this syntax and saying that the service is able to use any network interface on the host, but the MP0 is still one. So in this case, this ping should work because it's using a interface different than the MP0 is still one. So this is useful for instance to restrict the services from reaching the internet in this case. Uh, what else I can do? I can define a list or interface that are supported. So if I try to, to ping the loopback, this is going to work. And in this case, also if I try to ping the mm, internet, this is also going to work because both interfaces are allowed there. Finally, I can also use a, a deny approach with a list. So in this case, it says that none of those interfaces there is allowed. So this is not working. And yeah, the same happens for this one that is also not working. Let's go to the second property that we implemented. This is again uh, regarding security. Uh, this time, this is for restricting the, the types of the file system that processes are able to access. We also support the allow or the deny list in this case. And this feature provides an additional security layer because we are able to restrict the processes for accessing some of the dangerous file systems around. So a use case examples of that is that if we have a service that should be accessing files on a given partition, then we can restrict the types of file systems that this service is, this service is able to access to the type of the file system type of that given partition. Also, if there are other services that we know that they don't require this dangerous file system, then we could uh, restrict those from being used by those services. Some examples of dangerous file systems are CCFS, TraceFS, and so on. Regarding the implementation, this is using the linear security modules uh, together with eBPF. So those are the traditional LSN hooks, but this time instrumented with eBPF. What I mean is that we are able to use eBPF to make a decision of what to do once the hook is involved. So we can do a lookup in a map or we, we can implement whatever logic we want to make the decision. In this specific case, we are using the file open hook. So each time the process tries to open a file, we run uh, our eBPF program and based on some logic we are able to decide if the process is able to access the file or not. In this case the LSM eBPF programs are now cgroup aware so what it means for us is that we have to keep a single global program in the host. Uh, because of that 
we have to keep a global EBP map of maps where we store the different uh, magic numbers of the file systems and this is indexed by, by secret by this. So uh, in this specific case, the outer map is accessed by the C group ID. So we have this helper to get what is the C group ID where the application is running. And the inner map, we have a list of allow or deny file system magic numbers. And I'll show you in a second what, how we are able to access those magic numbers. So the, the magic, the, the program is receives this strat file. This is a, an internal kernel uh, structure. So for this reason, we have to use BPF core to read the magic number. So we have the file and we have the different members where we can find what is the magic number of the file system that is being accessed. Mm, the, the important part here is that the layout of this structure could change in different kernel versions. So that's the reason why we are using core. Even if the layout change from a kernel version to another one, uh, LibBPF will be able to calculate the specific offsets before loading the program into the kernel. Again, this program is rather small. This is just 66 lines of code and the kernel requirements are very similar to our previous property. This is 5.7, but this time we also need to have this uh, compilation flag uh, whether we have to to have BPF in this compilation flag, or otherwise we have to boot the kernel with this uh, parameter. We have to include BPF in the list of uh, Linux security modules that are used. Regarding the status of this PR, we already have one approval. We are waiting for all the reviewers, but yeah, mm, there has been a lot of interaction there, a lot of comments, a lot of reworking done by Iago and I think this is going to be merged for the next release. So because, yeah, this is almost ready to be merged for the next one. Okay, this is time for another demonstration about this feature. I have enabled the BPF security module on the kernel boot parameters. So this is important to be sure that this, this parameter is set to be able to try this feature. Mm, I'm going to create some, I'm going to create a, a, a file on the temporary folder just to test. Let, let me check that we are able to access that file from the host. So yeah, this is working fine. And again, I'm going to use a systemd run to create a temporary service. But in this case, this is going to be with the restricted file systems uh, property. So for instance, Let's say that we are going to restrict only to X4 and then I'm going to cut the contents of that file. So as you can see here, we got an operation error message while trying to access that file. If we look at the output of the mount command, we can see that the TMP folder is the type TMPFS. So this is the reason why this is not working. So we can add TMPFS here, and you can see that everything worked fine. We were, we were able to access the contents of the file. Mm, for instance, if I try to get the command line of the executable, again, in this case, there is a problem because the proc is a different file system, so in this case, to be able to do that, I should use the I should add proc there. So in this case, this is working. Mm. I call, for example, say that this is able to use whatever file system it wants, but not to use. Should in this case, this is proc. So if I try to read the file on the TMPFS file system, this is gonna work. But if I try to read If I try to read something on the proc FS, this is not gonna work. So yeah, by using this feature, we are able to, to restrict the file systems that 
uh, process can uh, access. If you want to know more details about the work that we did, there are some links on, on the presentation. So the first one is about blog post where we include all the details of the implementation. We have also some pointers to the code. And here we have different pointers to the different uh, topics that I cover in this presentation. I think this is all. Thank you very much for your time. And yeah, I'm happy to take any question that you can have. Thank you. Bye.